Welcome to episode 39. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. It's a new year, and if you're like me, you are already thinking about warmer weather and taking that getaway to that tropical or exotic destination. Maybe you plan to travel to Walt Disney World or Universal Studios. No matter what kind of trip you plan, 3D Travel Company is the company for you. Just visit 3dtravelcompany.com and let them know that Trenton sent you from Who Did That Voice. Or you can book on www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Book today and travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone and welcome to the show. You're listening to the second half of the interview with Pat Fraley on episode 39. So if you haven't heard episode 38, please listen to that first and then tune in for this part two. Hey everyone and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest hails all the way from Dimension X. He's Krang from the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is Krang. Report to me at once. My legions are waiting in Dimension X to storm into this world and crush it. Today's special guest hails all the way from Gotham City. That's right, folks. He's the lovable Batmite from Batman the Animated Series. Greetings, dynamic duo. I'm your biggest fan. What is it? I just want to help. <laughs> If you're a fan of the show Tailspin, then you will probably remember this character. Wildcat was the jolly, kind-hearted, inventive mechanic. Yeah, and what if you wiped out and fell down and bumped your head or something? Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. You know, another amazing show that you got to be a part of was back in the 90s, you played on Batman the Animated Series as the iconic Batmite. Where did that inspiration come from for his voice? Well, it just really was a high voice like that, wasn't it? Yeah, kind of. He was just like, I'm your biggest fan. By that time, I'd been working since uh, 79 in animation. So I had sort of a repertory company or I had stock character voices. And so it was a matter of Andrea Romano, the director, who had worked with me at Hanna-Barbera years before, remembering that I did silly high voices. Yeah. So it wasn't really an inspiration. It was a matter of bringing out a character voice that I'd done before, adjusting the character to fit that mic, and doing it. And I have to share one story. You know, we were working so much and auditioning so much is that I remember I auditioned within a couple days for Slick the Turtle on a show called The Littles, Tuffy the Smurf on The Smurfs, and another show that I can't recall that had the same voice. They all had the same high voice, you know, like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got all three. And so here I am on ABC, NBC, and CBS, those days the (laughs) networks, doing the same voice for three different characters. I thought, oh, my career is over. Well, It turned out they never watch each other's shows, so I got through. (laughs) That's fantastic. You know, but it is part of just pulling from the repertoire of what you have sometimes to continue on with your career, so. It's the basis of how we do it. When I first came to Hanna-Barbera and I worked with Dawes Butler and Don Messick and Frank Welker and Michael Bell and John Stevenson, Joni Gerber, June Foray, all these luminaries that I'd grown up with, by the way, uh, listening to. Uh, I just, it, it, in cartoons, I, it was just a shock. I mean, imagine it's like I walked in there and I hear these voices that I heard at nine years old. I didn't even know their names. But what happens is I, I thought first uh, old month or so and working with Mel Blanc, uh, I go in, I, I thought I am out of my league. These people are creative geniuses. <laughs> well, after about two months, I realized, wait, that's the same voice he did then on that other show. He just changed the dialect. Oh, that's the same character as this. 
And I realized that they were doing what I learned to teach, and that's just adjust different elements of a character voice. And sure, the character itself, the inner part, was different, but the sound of the voice was a matter of adjustment. And so these wonderful, wonderfully creative people were really leaning on management. They sort of were like an, a talent agency, and they only had five people, so they learned how to work them really well. And that, that was, a, that was a, uh, an eye-opener to me and, and an encouragement because uh, they did so much work, and I knew I wanted to and, and would. Absolutely, Pat. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that, especially the fact that you were able to work with Mel Blank. That's just super fantastic. And uh, I definitely look up to him as I know many people, especially in the industry do. So yeah, that was a thrill because, you know, I always loved that. She was one of my favorite characters. And she, you know, with that funny voice, with a, you know, lateral lisp, <laughs> you know, yeah. I should be put in prison for the scenes I'll steal. Well, what, what really shocked me was when you're in the room with him, and he's doing it, you get much more of an impression of the character rather than the voice. He was so arrogant and full of himself and vain as that duck. And I realized that it wasn't just, I was attracted by the voice, but the character in the performance is really what, in all his characters, was, he was so dynamic. Yeah. He was a very dynamic performer powerful uh, with a lot of energy. Now, Dawes Butler, who did so many voices on Hanna-Barbera shows, Huckleberry Hound, and all these other uh, shows, he was the best actor uh, uh, being a versatile player. And if you look at them both as versatile character uh, actors, he definitely was uh, the best actor in the group. Well, my favorite thing that Dawes did was... uh playing Elroy Jetson, so. Yeah, I asked him about that. Here he is, and I remember he was in his 70s when I worked with him, and he'd actually had a small stroke, and so he had to memorize the line or have it read to him, and then he'd perform it. And I was in the Jetsons in the tail end of it, uh, and I went to Dawes, and I said, how do you play this kid? How do you play a kid in your 70s? And he said, well, Pat, everything's new. <laughs> everything's new you know to a kid it's the first time so he go hi dad where's mom like he's never missed her before yeah <laughs> uh, everything what's for dinner like he's never had dinner before yeah <laughs> so it was all that newness that freshness of approach that really fueled uh elroy that little boy I mean, that cast of characters was just unique. And, I've, you know, so many people talk about the Flintstones, but the Jetsons to me, because of the futuristic aspect as well, I think, was always my absolute favorite of those two. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a clever show and certainly was in the old Hanna-Barbera style, but I think it was well written, too, for what it was. It had some good writing on it. And I don't recall, maybe you do, but I think, like, the Flintstones... It was a prime time show. I believe it was. It wasn't a Saturday morning show. Yeah. Yeah. And so they had a I, they had a bit more money for the uh, writers, and I probably had a bit more time to do those uh, scripts. I believe you're right because I know a lot of people seem to remember the Flintstones more. You know strong you know there's more of a strong image in their mind of Flintstones versus the Jetsons and I think that is why is because it was a primetime TV show yeah and I think they definitely had in mind to make a double-edged show which when you think about it with Warner Brothers and all of the theatrically released cartoons because you know it was 1958 before Hanna-Barbera started making shows for kids but when you when you look at the Flintstones and you look at the Jetsons, um, and, and you know this is a tradition, Pixar's this way. There's two levels: one for the adults to enjoy, and one for the kids to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Double, double edged shows. Yeah. Uh, and for example, I have to bend my mind in a different direction. Right now, I'm casting and and am going to start a animated program, which is for six to eleven year olds. Wow. Well, you don't have two levels. And I learned this back in the day when I was actually writing for uh, 
Sesame Street. And they give they gave me the challenge and my partner to write a couple animated shorts to teach kids how to count to four. And we'd put in these scripts and they go, No, it's too complex. No, this no, no, it's simple, simple, simple. And uh that sort of reminded me that when you do a show for little kids like Doc McStuffins and some shows, there's no other edge. It's not like Rocky and his friends, which is more for adults and kids, but kids like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in those days, the Flintstones, Jetsons, it definitely was for adults and kids. Absolutely. I would totally agree. There was a, a side to it that as I watch it when I'm older, I kind of go, hey, I didn't catch that as a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Doing the research on you last night, I was like, holy cow. Like, I knew you did a lot, but this was like, holy cow, brother. <laughs> uh, but so far, this has been a blast. And thank you so much for the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Real quick, when you were talking about Denver the Dinosaur, you said you were working with Cam Clark, and did you mention someone else, or was it just Cam there you mentioned from Turtles? Um, Cass Susi played the girl, and uh, I can't re- I know Tress McNeil was in there, either yeah. as a guest or a regular. Uh, I can't recall right off the top of my head, but it was a wonderful cast. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Tress McNeil's a sweetheart, and uh, I know you worked with her on Wizard of Oz. So We worked on a lot of stuff together. She was... When I first met her, she was a casting girl at uh, Voice Casters, which was a place we all went and would uh, we'd uh, audition in a casting place rather than go into our agents or do them from home. And she was just a great gal that cast or that recorded us. And then all of a sudden, bam, she came out and such such versatility and what a mind for comedy. Well, Pat, what what was it like getting to work on the show from 1986 called Centurions, where you played Max Ray, the Sea Operations Commander? Well, that's a, you know, I'm giving you a little story that goes along with them, because they all seem to have a story, and, and people are rather interested in that. But uh, Centurions was a show that really, it was in the day, there was an era where we had, well, when I first started off, we only did 13 Scooby-Doo's a year, and they okay. rerun them. Yeah. So we were only doing shows from maybe May to the end of June, and then we were done. It was like cherry picking, and then the rest of the time, good luck. You better get commercial. <laughs> yeah. So then, with the success of He Man, done by Filmation in 1983, I believe, they got huge numbers because they created cartoons for after school. That's when that started, and it just opened a floodgate to work because we went from. Uh, uh, have been cast in shows that would be 13 to 65, 65 shows in the package. And they were going so strong that they really would just uh, audition us and we got the job. It was, it, it was, they had to work fast. They didn't have callbacks. It was very, very fast. So Centurions is one of those shows. Ruby Spears did it, I think. And uh, the funny part was that uh, previously, about a month earlier, I was doing G.I. Joe playing the character of Ace, the fly guy. Yeah, right? yeah. And it was pretty much my voice, maybe a little bit tougher, you know. And I, I got to one of the sessions, and uh, I hadn't read the script, and we, we were doing the read-through. And somebody, uh, I had gone on a mission at the beginning of the, the episode, and then someone asked one of the girls in the show, uh, well, how's Ace? And she said, he didn't come back. And I'm looking at the pages, and I'm dead. <laughs> I got killed. I went, really? Oh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> so cut to about a month later. I'm up in Seattle doing something, and I have an audition for this Centurion show. And so I think, well, Ace is dead, so I'll use his voice for this character. So I auditioned, got the role. Meanwhile, in L.A., Neil Ross, who I did a lot of shows with, was thinking, oh, you know what? Frazier's ace is dead. I'll use his voice. <laughs> we both got cast. I, I got a call from the producer and uh, uh, Michael Hack, and he said, I got bad news. One of you guys has to go because you have the same voice. Because they put it together finally, you know. And we, I, I got Neil over to my office and said, okay, one of us has to go high and one of us has to go low because we're both <laughs> we're tenors. Well, he was a little higher. So he went high, he went high with his character, and I went as low as I possibly could. I was the first character that I really went low on. And so poor Neil, 
I'd gone to the producer when we started recording the shows and said, look, I'm in the basement. I can't go lower. Okay. Poor Neil. Every session, he must have got the note 12 times. Higher, higher, higher. <laughs> he go higher on every show. But uh, that's how that came down uh, the pike. And I think we did about 65 shows on that. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I know the show was... Uh, it's one that I remember from my childhood, but not vividly. Uh, but it was one of those that just left an imprint on me that was like, wow, you know, it was action packed. And these guys had these like crazy suits that were like, what is that? And, you know, these, you know, almost like a super how uh, like a superpower of sorts. But, you know, they were just like, you know, armored soldiers, kind of like, uh, you know, G.I. Joe or something. But uh, it was just a unique spin. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, we had exo frames and I think I went under the dirt and... Another character could fly, and yeah, I got to tell you another funny thing. At that time, I think there was a uh, the FCC or somebody came up with the shows had to have or networks and stations had to have a certain amount of educational content, and so on each show we'd have a one minute little prequel to the show or somewhere they put it in where it talk about you know um, ecology or they talk about something you know, yeah. that was educational. And a lot of times they gave this dialogue to the mainstay to a character called Dr. Wu. Now, Dr. Wu was a character that did all the uh, exposition, it turns out, in the shows. He'd give the, the guys their mission and the gal. Yeah. Okay, well, my contract was light on the first show, and, the, and they said, you're Dr. Wu. And I'm like, I can't do Asian? He goes, oh, you do now. <laughs> so I did this horrible doc. You know, I had this horrible, you know, I am told die I die. It was really bad, <laughs> you know. And so it comes out, come to find out, he does all the uh, the educational. The cast w hated it so much and made fun of me so much that when it came time for me to do that, they'd all leave the studio. <laughs> oh, wow. They'd all leave the booth and go have coffee until I was done. Goodness. Yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is most fascinating. And, you know, being able to talk with you about that show is just fantastic because all of the shows that we've talked about have all been something that had an impact on me. And I know there are other people that will have been impacted by your career and your life and the shows that we've mentioned and some we haven't even talked about yet. Um, you know, you got to work on another show that had a diverse cast, which was Gargoyles, the animated series back in 1994. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, some of the cast members on that were even from Star Trek The Next Generation. What was it like working on, on a show like that with such a diverse cast? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, our, in that cast, a lot of times, I only did a few shows as guests, as a guest. And Ed Asner was in it. That's become a very popular show. So I don't really recall too much about working with the cast as far as... Uh, a full recording with the whole cast. I know I was in with other actors, but I must say when I did Invasion America, uh, Spielberg's, uh, his, his attempt to go into uh, animation at that time, oh my goodness, we had uh, Miguel Ferrer and James Syking and all these on-camera actors in there, and that was a lot of fun. And later on, I, I, I had such joy working with Lily Tomlin and and Mark Hamill and all these people that did voice or, or on camera that did voiceover. And that's always really educational and fun because I remember sitting next to Mark Hamill doing wing commander Academy. We did a season of that and it was all stars. It was Ron Perlman, it was Elliot Gould, uh, Malcolm McDowell, Dana Delaney. They're all there. And I remember that, that Mark and I were playing fly guys. We were in jets. And so we're communicating to each other. And I go, Maverick, watch your tail. You know, you're six o'clock. And he goes, I'm on it. And I stopped the whole session. Wait a minute. He's face acting. He's done this before. <laughs> of course, I don't have to yell. I've got a, a you know, I've got, I've got a, you know, device. So I, I said, let me take that again. He tricked me. And he was laughing about it. <laughs> but learned a lot about acting and what you could do and what you didn't have to be loud all the time. Frank Welker and I used to talk about that. I said, gee, all my choices are loud. Why didn't I come up with one character that was quiet? <laughs> 
Well, that is fantastic that you got to work with Mark Hamill. I believe you also got to work with him on Red Planet, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and also Incredible Hulk, and we became friends. We have a lot in common with our families and stuff. And uh, Mark is funny because I do a perfect Mark Hamill impression. Okay, I can sound exactly like Mark Hamill. Because this is a way he talks. <laughs> and so I would do an interview and I'd go into his voice and make fun of him. And, you know, so about five months ago, he was, I think it was about five or six months, he was doing a, a, a circuit promoting a Star Wars film. Yeah. And I got a email message from one of my um, students saying, he's doing an impression of you. And I went, oh yeah, well maybe. And then I heard it and it was, I don't know if anybody's ever done a bang on impression of you in front of you, but it's, it's creepy. <laughs> it's weird. And here I am driving my car and he does me perfectly. I've never had anybody do a closer impression of how I talk. Wow. And I have, you have to get back to him, but he got me back. I got to tell him he got me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Mark is definitely... Um left an impact on the world just like you have that's for sure so that's cool that you guys have such a good friendship and that y'all have bonded so well through your connections in life and family so yeah he's an awfully nice man mark love him he's a one a joy to work with and he has all the stories tell stories about harrison ford and and stuff and and uh he's got a wealth of stories i love hearing about Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Pat. That was definitely a treasure for sure. You know, another amazing show that you got to be on was the Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa, and you played Marshall Moo Montana. Do you remember that show? Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the lines I loved is, you know, if your head gets too big, your hat won't fit. <laughs> <laughs> he told that to a little kid. That was, an, that was one of the, another one of the few heroes that I played. I used to be comedy relief in cartoons, but I did that and Brave Star and a couple other ones where I was a hero. And the the funny part was it was such a strange concept. You got cows on horseback <laughs> and I remember when Ginny McSwain auditioned me, she goes, do you have any questions? I say, yeah. What do they eat? Did you get <laughs> off the horse and graze with the horse? Or, you know, it was very strange because the women looked had cow faces and their earrings were those tags they put on cow's ears. Yeah. And then they had a, you know, a bodice and a waist like a human. It was very weird. <laughs> well, it was, I always, think we did two seasons. Yeah. I think it did do two seasons. It, to me, it always really struck me as a very unique cartoon as a kid. I remember it, you know, not vividly again, but I remember the, the three main characters that, uh, you know, you and, and your other two partners. And it was just, they were just so different and so unique. And it was like, yeah, why is this cowboy a cow? You know, <laughs> like, but uh, it was just so unique. Yeah, we had some great guests at that time. Danny Mann was a, re a regular character and Tim Curry came in to play some roles. And so we had some influx of some wonderful uh, uh, guest actors by that time. Enjoyed it. Absolutely. Well, and I, I didn't actually know this until uh, last night before our interview um, that Jim Cummings was Dakota Dude and that Jeff Bennett was the Colorado Kid. Colorado Kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was something else. And I, and I remember I have to tell this story, too, is on the first session, I'm, I – Sit, I'm sitting next to, or standing. We usually stand, by the way, when we do sit or stand. Yeah. Uh, actually, now that I think of it, uh, most of them are sitting. Really? Okay. And then sometimes we stand. But we were standing for this first one. And the uh, the producer's back there, and Ginny McSween is holding the session. And she says, Pat, I'm losing, the, I'm losing your hero. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. And here's the you know client, the producer, right next to her. I just got white and started getting, you know, the, that hot, cold feeling. Yeah. And Jim's going, think Jack Armstrong, which was an old hero for the radio. He's trying to help me as I go. What a nightmare. <laughs> but I got through it and kept the role, but I almost lost it. Wow, goodness. Well, I'm glad you didn't lose it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, a couple of other shows that we'll talk about real quick before we wrap up were Glow Friends okay. and Widget. Yeah, Glow, everybody. Glow Maggots. We used to call it Glow Maggot. <laughs> Glow Howie Maggots. Mandel was in that show too, and was he? And uh, it was a, you know, just one of those silly uh, ways of selling to a toy. 
Yeah. He did 65 yeah. episodes. And uh, I do recall one funny story. It's Frank Welker, I met on my first day working. Everyone's worked with Frank because he does all the shows. Yeah. Such a gracious guy, you know, wonderful guy. Uh, and so talented at doing all sorts of stuff. Well, we're doing uh, a chorus singing of the main title. And I can't sing. I just, I'm horrible. So I thought, well, I'll sidle up to Frank and then I'll pick up the melody and keep with him. Well, I sidled up to him. It was like absolutely horrible. He was worse than I was. Also, Howie Mandel had to be hit in the back of the head to start singing. That's how he got his cue. <laughs> Seriously? You didn't give him a countdown. You hit him in the head and he start singing. <laughs> wow. So I was so pleased that some other actors have skills but don't sing. <laughs> Well, I remembered having a glow, one of those little glow worms as a kid. You know, you push the stomach or whatever, and it like the face would light up. And I was like, that was a cartoon. I was like, I didn't even remember that. But the theme song was yeah. super cute. So, well, the idea a lot of times back then was that they created a cartoon show, and it really just was an ongoing promo for the toys. In fact, I think to this day, isn't uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles still pro or, uh, produced by a, uh, a toy company? I believe, I know Nickelodeon is partnered with it, but I think Hasbro or one of those other companies is like the parent, like partner with them on that, I think. That's yeah. right. So, yeah. It, it was all about selling toys yeah. for years. And I think yeah. it's still kind of that way, but it's shifted a little bit from how yeah. it used to be from when it was just solely for the toys. Right. Do you remember working on Widget as well with, um, I'm totally blanking out here. Bruce, uh, 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 Lucy Taylor. Yeah, that's it. That's in it. fact, I, I think I have the record in that show. I was not cast in, I was not cast in it. So I, w I, w I was not a reg regular or reoccurring role. And we did 65 shows and I was a guest on 65 shows. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trust me, Neil, we, we had this, uh, uh, couple that were uh explorers something so i did a lot there and then i got another role that they'd call me in on so it was mercy casting wow i got along with the producer and he got me in every show well, that is fantastic i don't think i've ever heard of anyone that guest starred on every episode <laughs> no no it was highly wow. unusual absolutely yeah you played one of the characters that i remembered was mega slink who was kind of the you know captor of different characters on the show and stuff so yeah i can't remember that he was that a little, one. he was kind of like that little green Martian that Bugs Bunny has to deal with in the Looney Tunes cartoon. He kind of was like that, but he was yellow and wore red. And, but anyway, he was kind of like the evil uh, Noah Ark he, capturing animals and creatures. <laughs> you know, Trent, um, we were working so much that we didn't see the shows. Yeah. You were lucky if you saw a quick image, right? Uh, and I don't think I saw one widget show. Okay. Uh, I okay. think I've seen probably six Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shows out of 200. Well, as busy of an actor as you are, I, I'm surprised you've even seen any, honestly. <laughs> well, it, uh, you know, I, I did buy The Tick. I love The Tick. And yeah. so I, I have watched some of those and a few others. But sometime when I'm really old, I can just sit down and watch the rest of my life on cartoons and see what I did. <laughs> yeah. Just retire and then watch all of the shows you've done. Yeah. Townsend Coleman yeah. is a tick is fantastic. So yeah. Townsend. Yeah. Townsend. Yeah. Yeah. Townsend's the uh, tick is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal <laughs> performance. Yeah. I was originally cast in it as the tick. And then the creator, Ben Ingman, I think his name wanted to try it. So they went to him and I lost it, and they didn't come back to me, which often happens. You know, they yeah. they have to justify, or they, they they think so. And they went to Townsend, and I was, you know, uh, I was uh, disappointed. But then when I heard what Townsend did with it, I thought, wow, yeah, it was so good. I got to play a lot of the strange villains, though, so I love the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Pat, in closing, I've got two final questions for you, and we will wrap this up. Do you have a favorite cartoon from growing up? And if so, what is your favorite cartoon or your favorite cartoon character? Well, I think it's got to be Warner Brothers and Daffy Duck, as I mentioned. Although when I was very young, I liked Donald Duck. I think I liked him, Donald Duck, because he would have tantrums. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so those were favorites of mine. When I went, uh, I was not crazy about Bugs Bunny, but loved Daffy Duck, because he was just out there. So it would be Warner Brothers that I really 
admire certainly Chuck Jones direction of Warner Brothers cartoons, Roadrunner, a lot of that stuff. I, I really liked as a kid. And but I never thought of doing voices. I didn't know people did their voices. I don't know what I thought. Yeah. It's like a puppet until somebody points it out. Uh I just liked and also in those days, uh when the color splashed on the screen in the theater, you know it was your time. Because I saw a lot of bad movies. I mean, they didn't start making movies for kids until I think I was nine. So we went to adult movies. And they were always black and white and boring. But at the beginning, there would be the opening title to Woody the Woodpecker or something, Popeye. And I remember getting a rush of something, I guess adrenaline, as a kid, knowing this is my time. (laughs) Time just for Pat Fraley. (laughs) That's right. Well, Pat, my last and final question today is, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Well, you know, I don't really think about legacy. Um, I'm grateful to God for meeting my family's needs in a creative way. That's the best thing about it. I'm blessed that I've been able to do something that I've been passionate about, teaching and performing my whole career. So uh, I, I just don't think of legacy. I'm pleased that I've been able to give people a respite from the harshness of reality, which each day gets seems to get worse. And uh, I'm grateful for that as well. But uh, legacy, you know, not sure whether I, I, I just don't focus on that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, I know everyone doesn't necessarily think about a legacy, um, but it is a question I like to ask my actors just because... You know, a lot of times the shows that they have created have left so much of a legacy, you know, behind just because of the impact they've had on people's lives and the way it's changed. Um, But, you know, I understand that that I understand that that's not something you think about. So, yeah, well, you know, but that's but it's an excellent question. Thank you. uh, Thank you. uh, My answer is lame, but there you go. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's it, nothing about today has been lame, Pat. Believe me. All right. Um, and, and it's been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today, Pat. Would you please just give us a closeout today as Krang? I would be happy to. Well, I've enjoyed the time with you. And this is the end of Who Did This Voice. Did I get that right, Chris? <laughs> Who did this voice? And I would add to this, who cares? (laughs) Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Pat Fraley as much as I enjoyed recording it for you. You know, after the show, I asked him what he thought of my questions during the interview, and here's what he had to say. Good questions. And I haven't talked about, I haven't talked about half of those characters ever, never been asked questions about those characters, so... Yeah, you know, the usual Teenage Mutant Ninja and stuff like that. But no, Centurions, Cowboys in the Maze, shows like that. Boy, I had to go, oh, yeah, I remember. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us this Tuesday for our next special guest, Renee Jacobs, the voice of April O'Neil from the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself, who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they've voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.